How many of you like food that will just blow your mind? Okay, most everyone, so that's impressive. So from a food perspective, it doesn't get any bigger than this. Um, we're really, really lucky to uh, have Adrian put together, I think, probably the coolest uh, authors at Google event that we've ever had in Chicago. And I'll go as far as to say the greatest event we've had at Google, period. Um, <laughs> this is truly extraordinary, and I think we're really lucky. And I think we were chatting with um, Nick and Grant a little bit beforehand. I think you guys will be blown away by how they think about the, the you know, food and the restaurant business and customer experience and all of that. So. I um, want to make sure that you, know, you guys have lots of great Q&A, et cetera, after they speak. So um, just one housekeeping note, if you are going to um, ask questions, we need to make sure that you come up here and ask them in the microphone. Right, Jordan? All right. So, um, so just make sure you come up and ask uh, a question in the microphone. It's a great opportunity. So I want to introduce Grant Ackett's and Nick Kakonis, who are the co-owners of Alinea, um, one of the best restaurants in the world. And I, and I mean that when I say the world. It's not just Chicago, um, which is pretty exciting that Chicago has a restaurant of that caliber. Um, obviously, we've put out some great chefs over time, but Grant, I think, has really taken that to a whole new level. Um, I just want to read a couple things uh, very quickly. Um, in the words of the International Chefs Congress, Grant is one of the leading visionaries of modern cuisine. And his restaurant, Alinea, is widely viewed as one of the premier dining experiences in the world and the home of American avant-garde fine dining. Um, Grant, has, Grant and the restaurant have won numerous awards um, throughout the years, which is great in and of itself. But um, in 2008, Grant was named a James Beard Award winner uh, for the best chef in America. So um, truly, truly an amazing feat um, for anybody. And we love it that it's a hometown guy. Um, Nick is a co-owner of the restaurant and um, comes more with a business background as opposed to Grant's um, cooking background, which started when you were five, I believe it was. Um, Nick and Grant got together as uh, when Grant was working at Trio Restaurant in Evanston. Nick was a frequent diner and got to know each other and decided that they were going to open a restaurant, but not only open a restaurant, but open up the best restaurant in the world. And they've succeeded in that. So um, today they're going to talk about a number of things, but I want to show you this cookbook that they've just put out, and they'll talk a little bit about this is a cookbook. <laughs> Have you ever seen a cookbook that big? Unbelievable. So um, really exciting. Congratulations to you guys. Thank you so much for coming to Google and being a part of our day. And uh, we look forward to hearing all your great stories. Great. All right. Am I live? Yeah. Check, check. Okay. There we go. Well, we're really excited. Um, it was really, it was really, we were li really looking forward to coming and, and walking around Google and checking it out. It's got that kind of, maybe not for you all, but for us, it's got that you know aura about it. So it was really exciting. I know for me and especially for Nick. So thank you for having us. We're we're really excited to be here. Yeah, we always like to tell people that uh, Alinea is the restaurant that Google built, because. Um, when we built it, we had about four people that, that worked on conceptualizing the restaurant and uh, starting it all out. And anytime we had a question, uh, you know, what's the dew point of water <laughs> like so that we, it wouldn't drip on, on, on the tables because we weren't going to have tablecloths, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a second away from you. So we did that hundreds of times a day. And we approached it like that. And that's what we're going to talk about today rather than just sort of pimping our book or um, talking about necessarily, obviously we'll touch on the food, that's the most important thing and that's what Grant does. Um, in this context, I think it makes sense to talk about a little bit about what we did to try to make Alinea different. Yeah, so a little bit of background about me and in, in my career. Um, born and raised in a restaurant family. My grandmother, my parents, a lot of my aunts and uncles owned restaurants in Michigan. Um, small diner type establishments, breakfast, lunch, dinner, seven days a week. The place where you would go get mashed potatoes, meatloaf, a burger, a good omelet on Sunday. Uh, I grew up in, in the kitchen, um, put me up on a milk crate so I could reach the bottom of the pot sink, um, working my way through prep cook and eventually, you know, when I got my driver's license, I would be working at my parents' restaurant after school. Um, so, you know, pretty, pretty mediocre student, honestly, in high school. What didn't really apply myself, with the exception of 
more art-driven classes, so anything that I could touch with my hands or kind of dream about, I ended up applying myself, which led me to culinary school directly after high school, Culinary Institute of America um, in Hyde Park, New York, <clears throat> with the ambition to essentially become a great chef. And I thought at the time that going to culinary school and the 18-month program that that it was there, I would emerge as this great chef. Uh, that wasn't the case. I realized that I had to go work uh, out in the real world, gain some valuable experience from talented individuals, find a mentor. I was uh, drawn back to Chicago, or to Chicago, I should say, and I worked for Charlie Trotter for a period of time, a very short period of time. Um, really short period really of short time. Period of time. <laughs> we, we didn't really, I, I often tell my cooks and, and employees at the restaurant now that, you know, working in restaurants you at this level especially, you have to be so committed to it, you have to sacrifice so much, it's very much like being in a relationship. And you have to find the right restaurant, you have to find the right person. And that wasn't quite the right restaurant for me. Anyways. So I moved on, eventually found a home uh, in Napa at the French Laundry, and found a mentor, Thomas Keller. Worked there for about five years, four and a half years, and it was really uh, an important part of, of my career path and trajectory as a chef and eventually as a, as a business owner. Um, wanted to break free from the umbrella, which was Thomas Keller, and forge out on my own, create my own style of cooking, I was thinking about food a little bit differently than he did, and wound up here in Evanston at Trio. Uh, ran that restaurant, that kitchen, for about three years, from 2001 to 2004. I uh, started to get some acclaim and some recognition, but it was Evanston, and it was small and sleepy, and it was hard to get people to make that drive up Lakeshore and into Sheridan um, to come and eat my food. Fortunately, Nick became a regular diner at, at Trio, had a basically a standing uh, weekly reservation, would come in and eat frequently, and we got to know each other, and one day he said to me, kind of in passing and half jokingly, you know, if you ever want to open a restaurant, your own restaurant, you know, maybe we can do it together, and it kind of went from there. And my background is pretty much the polar opposite of that. I grew up... Uh, as a really picky eater who didn't care about food at all. Food wasn't really part of my family life. Probably um, in my twenties when I met my wife that, that like her family was the opposite. They loved food. So I was in a process of like discovering food, you know, as an adult and became very passionate about it, and read a lot, and investigated it and all that. And, uh, spent about ten years as a derivative creator of a philosophy major undergrad and um, Serial entrepreneur just did a bunch of different things. So I, I worked on as a currency options uh, trader and then developed the first clothing seller network between uh, New York exchanges and Chicago exchanges to do an arbitrage of um, exchange big funds. And uh, that went well. And we grew to about 85 employees. Merged with a, a firm in New York and found myself kind of at that point where you know, you're really like to work in a small environment. Now it's grown to the point where you kind of want to get out. And I'm glad you did that. And currently, I'd also um, invested in a, in a couple websites. In 1997, one was fundbrain.com. Also did my financial software. They built a children's entertainment site. They're now investors in Alinea. That went well, too. And um, so I met Grant, and we had traveled. My wife and I had traveled. We, eaten and discovered food together, and, uh, you know, five minutes from our house was the best restaurant in the world, but no one quite knew about it. Like, you need one a bunch of awards, but you go there on a Wednesday night, there'd be 35 people, and you kind of want to scream to people. You know, I'd call people in San Francisco or New York, you guys, where we are, and I'd say, the best restaurant in America is in suburban Chicago, and they'd just laugh, you know, and then I'd always wager, like, finding a fly out here, and we'll see, you know, and, uh, one day, uh, for my wife's birthday, Greg had made an amazing meal. It was the first time we'd eaten in the kitchen there. And it was amazing because, unlike the other commercial kitchen I'd ever seen, it was dead silent. It was like a watch maker trap and put on. I mean, it was, it was just perfectly, just more serious, much different than anything you see on TV. 
And I got to watch him cook, and he got to watch me eat. Like, he was like, you know, I sort of said, this disconnect between what's going on out there and what's going on here, and this stuff that's in America, he's kind of defensive, going, service is perfect. I said, yeah, it is. But if you need the box, you need the whole packet. And he, was, he obviously agreed that six days later, he'd been thinking the same thing, you know. And six days later, he emailed me this link, the email. And uh, that's it. Literally uh, a year later to the day of our first investment, he was working. So, kind of delving into building the restaurant and our philosophy, both creatively with, with the restaurant and its operations and the food and, and ultimately with life, um, we pretty much ripped apart the entire experience of dining, of eating, of food, you could say deconstructed in a way, analyzed each component and started to put it all back together to form Alinea. And you know, we, we, we have a, a series of examples that we, that we want to share with you to kind of illustrate you know, breaking it down into its very primary components and challenging each one, pushing the boundaries where we feel that it was uh, compelling to do so. Some, some cases we left, you, know, you have to have a table in a restaurant, or at least we had to have a table in a restaurant. But, but we did ask whether or not you had right. to have one. Could we stand? Why they were there. Right. right. Can you stand? Can you sit on the floor? I mean, literally challenging every aspect. Um, do, do you want to talk about? Yeah, well, I mean, like the first time Grant came by, you know, for the very first meeting that we had where we said, okay, maybe we want to do this together. One of the first things, you know, when I said, okay, well, what's your vision? You know, you've been thinking about this since you were five. What is it? And the first question he asked me is he said, do you know why fancy restaurants have tablecloths? I said, well, it's luxurious and, and it feels good and it's soft and you know, it looks fancy. Wow. Why, why does that look fancy? It looks fancy and feels luxurious because that's what you've been conditioned to feel into Western dining. It's really because the table underneath is a piece of crap. And they're trying to hide it and put some pad on it and screw it to a face and they put it down to the bottom so you can't really look under there. And he's like, but you, you know, you feel it. Like you put your hands on the table and you get a really expensive restaurant and you can feel the lack of quality. He's like, I want to get rid of the table. Book. So I said, well, I already four star restaurant. Like maybe we'll never get a four star review from anybody and people will come in and it's so ingrained we can't break that. And so we got on the computer and still we didn't Google, you know, how many four star restaurants are. We started looking at the top 50 restaurants in the world, looked at the pictures and every one of them had a table call. And he was like, there's no way I'm having table like, we went to <laughs> we went to like design, we went to designer meetings and like you know, our interior like when we got further down the road and every single person was like, We're gonna have tablecloths. And he's like, We're not. We're gonna make tables that are beautiful, elegant, and it's gonna be like the stage where it's blank and then we build upon it. And that was like the first design mantra that, that we sort of mutually agreed on and then went, Okay, now what problems does that cause? You know, other than people's perception of it, from a dining experience, what happened? And actually a lot happens, because if you think about it, uh, just the one aspect of not having a tablecloth, basically, there's a whole host of problems that goes with that. One is, where do you put silverware? Like, a lot of people find it kind of gross to put silverware directly on a wood table, especially if you're in a public place. If you're at home and you're eating with your family, maybe that's one thing. But when you're in a public restaurant, you know, you don't want to put, so what do we do? What do we do with, what do we do with, with silverware? Uh, we have a photo here of what we did. Maybe. Yeah, we'll photo. Sorry, we'll So that's the empty table there. So we basically collaborated with Crucial, uh, Crucial Detail Design Studio, Martin Kastner, whom we, we work with closely with all of our service pieces that you've seen on the screen, and he's done our website and our identity and all that sort of thing. And essentially we created a mini table to put on the table <laughs> to hold the silverware. And, you know, it, it's a design element, it's sanitary, 
It has a removable pillow that you wash after each use. So it's kind of a, it, it was born out of function, became a design element, became something creative and, and unique and original. Um, you know, Nick mentioned the water. You know, what you have cold water going into a glass on a bare table, what happens? Well, condensation leaves water on the table, it leaves a ring. So, you know, what do we do? Now, so now the first thought is placemat under the under the plate, and then you've got your little you know thing for the water and, and the wine, and pretty soon you've got so many of those you have a table bar. So we were just kind of like, well, you know, if you just chill water right above the dew point, it's not going to compensate. What's the how do you calculate that? Done. Right. That was easy. That was five minutes. So we have like a fridge full of water. You know, there is no point. <laughs> like today. But I mean, like you know, in the summer, if you just move it up a couple degrees, and you'll notice that you never get ice or linea. The reason you don't get ice is because we don't want condensation on the table. It, it's more like that seems like one of those really, really simple things. And yet, every restaurant you go to has ice and it's a mess. And do you really need ice water? Is it better? I don't think you do. So, you know, again, really simple, like, one simple decision design models led to like 30 other, you know, similarly more more and more like you know, we kept throwing more problems at Martin and saying like, okay, we need, you know, a hammock for our silverware, we need like, you know, some way to do this. And it just it became part of the identity of the restaurant. We went we went as far as like I like I said, pretty much analyzing every aspect of the experience. So one of the one of the other interesting things for those of you that have been um, is the hallway, the entryway to the restaurant. And it it's kind of has that Alice in Wonderland, false perspective, kind of shrinking down um, visual to it. And the reason for, there's actually a reason for that besides it kind of being cool and different was the restaurant experience itself was so important to us that we needed to mentally transition you from Halstead Street to your table. So in a lot of restaurants, you'll, you'll get out of the taxi, you'll step in a puddle, you'll open the front door, and there'll be somebody standing behind a podium with the reservation book in front of you, and they'll ask you your name, and you'll tell them. And there's this human barrier, and it's an awkward entryway, and it's not comfortable, and it's not welcoming. We wanted to make it feel like you were coming into somebody's home as opposed to a formal setting or a restaurant. So. We created the hallway. We actually ended up chewing up square feet where we could have ultimately put an extra table in and made more money perhaps, but we decided that it was very important for you to mentally transition away from the city and refresh yourself, walk into the space, have it be a little bit of a journey, have it be disorienting in a way, have it be intriguing, exciting, all of the things that we hoped that the experience would evoke in you, we tried to mimic in the actual entryway. There's, there's another purpose too, is that it creates a bit of tension. When you open the door, there's no sign on, on the street. You open the door, and we've all been there like where you, you get to the place of meals. When it's a keepers, right? Right. <laughs> you know, I'm here. So it's like you get to that door, and you're not quite sure, am I in the right place? And so you create a bit of tension. And then you walk down the hallway, and you still are like, well, you know, where the hell is the person dreaming? It's a good restaurant. And so you created this, this tension, and then these two doors, you know, the Star doors open up, and you, you walk in, and there's someone there greeting you by name. And so you create tension and you leave it. And that experience of creating tension and relieving it happens over and over and over again in the linea. Um, it happens with, with, when you walk in the door, like very obviously, though you don't know to expect it, hopefully, well now you do. Um, and it, it's ruined completely, but but uh, but then you you get there, and then during your meal, a number of lessons happen. You, know, you sit down. One of the things that Grant said, like the, the instrument has the point to put. What kind of floor are we gonna have on the table? And Grant said, What's the purpose of that? It's why, you know, the same question. Now, why the heck do you have flowers on the table? Like you don't want them to smell anyway. You're gonna, you know, so why are they there? And if they're too big, then you're kind of doing you know that thing. So, food-wise. So we said, okay, if, if people are going to put a tiny little bouquet of roses on the table or a candle on the table, it's purely aesthetic. It's the only reason they're there. So 
let's somehow take that component of the dining experience, make it aesthetic, but also make it functional. So let's make it food. Um, let's come up with a concept, what we call the edible centerpiece, which is placing a beautiful object on the table. So in this particular case, you have uh, key limes that are shrink wrapped in plastic. And they become this, again, intriguing, they create some, some tension, they create some conversation immediately when you sit down. People are picking them up, they're looking at them, they're talking to their dining companion, what is this, what are they doing with this, where's my flowers? <laughs> and, and immediately you've engaged people, which is kind of the whole point of what we do. Um, so we, we've had several iterations of that. In this case you have limes. So whatever it is, at one point or another, unexpectedly, a service member comes up, picks that centerpiece off the table, and manipulates it in some way. Here we show him puncturing it with a special puncture. He squeezes it and produces lime juice that he then drizzles over a particular course. So you have the aesthetic component, you have the functional component, you have the emotional component, and it kind of makes the experience richer. What else? <laughs> That's it. That's yeah. It. That's the whole thing. Now, um, and you know, the other thing, just going back to that front hall too, that's, that's interesting, is that the, the functional problem from managing a restaurant with that hall, you end up having to hurt people. You know, because for the, the, the uh, we stagger reservations like one table every 15 minutes or so. But what ends up happening is, you know, days early and, and someone else is late because their babysitter didn't show up. And so all of a sudden you have, you know, the, the, the Joneses with the, the, the Bobs, and they're all like you know, eight people showing up at once. And what you notice is that our hallway goes down, and you know, maybe two people can fit in at once. Certainly not two parties can fit in at once. And that's very intentional. It, it, it forces people to pause and take notice of what's happening. But it also allows our staff to address everybody individually. So again, through the design, we're trying to craft a very specific experience. And I, I think, um, you know, we, just, we had a little talk earlier um, with, with some of, uh, some of the, the people here. You know, one of the things that, that we always looked at is we never asked, like, what kind of food do people want to eat or what kind of dining experience do they want to have? We always asked, what kind of emotional experience can we engage them with tonight? And I always thought eating Grant's food was fun because there's such an element of surprise and such an element of unexpected um, know, intellectual curiosity that you were forced to have in the experience. Now, not everybody wants to sit down and dine like that. I mean, that's not the purpose of dining everywhere. Like, sometimes you just want to go out and have a hamburger and talk to the people you're with. And if all of a sudden the waiters are telling you what you have to do and you need to, like, figure out what the centerpiece is, that's not always a good thing. But once in a while it is, and I think we built the place for, with that goal in mind every step along the way. Yeah, we, when we, right before we were about to open, for the first time we gathered the staff in the kitchen. There was still, the restaurant was still under construction. We, we unfortunately had started booking reservations too early in the construction process and we were running up against a deadline to get open in time. So we were kind of rushed at the end. We gathered the entire staff and I told them that we were going to open the best restaurant in the country. And it was interesting for me to look at people after I made that kind of bold statement to judge their reaction. Like some people were nodding, like yeah, let's go get it. Some people were looking at me like I was completely out of my mind. Some people were just rolling their eyes going like, whatever. This is Ego. just, yeah, Ego, man. right. <laughs> but ultimately, you could tell by that, at that moment what our ambitions were. We kindled the fire. People were very passionate about it. And a year and a half later, we actually achieved our goal, where Gourmet Magazine the editor-in-chief, Ruth Reichel, who's a very, very prominent food writer and critic in the country, the most, actually, um, named Alinea the best restaurant in the country. And 
I remember, you know, being elated and calling him and being like, guess what, ha guess what phone call I just got? And it was a giant, it was a giant victory for us and, and something. Right. <laughs> and then... I said, uh, now what? Okay. I like, right. you know, set some more goals. But, you know, no, you never, you put those out there not so that you can achieve them, but so you have a point to go to. You right. Know, and that's we ought to recognize that as well. And I, obviously what we haven't talked about is the thing that I always considered a, a given, which was, which is the food itself. And what, you know, what you're looking at there is, you know, again, how to engage the diner. Um, grants created, you know, with, with the team there, what, 10, 12 different ways to, to utilize aroma to to bring another aspect which is incredibly important to taste to the forefront but to do so in an elegant way. So what you're seeing there, uh, I'll, I'll let the chef talk about the food I think. Well the food, the, the food is supposed to be it, like we like we said, an emotional experience. We're trying to we're not interested in just filling your stomach. We're not, you know, interested in in calories, it, it, you can you can be on either side of the craft or art side of the coin with food, and I think we we blur that line and we run right down the middle. Um, we're trying to basically tell a story. Food is our medium, and we do that by a 12 or 24 course or 27 course meal or somewhere in between. We have you in the chair from anywhere from two and a half to five, six hours, depending on how, how quickly you want to go. And we run the range of emotions, ideally, where you're going to be presented with bites of food that are challenging, flavor combinations that are unusual, uh, presentations that are going to make you laugh, are going to make you blush, are going to make you intimidated, um, are going to make you curious because you've never seen it before. They're going to uh, evolve a sense of nostalgia in some cases where we intentionally will, like Nick said, provide aromas with, the certain, with food. We've done, you know, I grew up in Michigan raking leaves in the autumn, you know, burning them at the side of the road after you jump in them a couple of times. So to me, the smell of, of burning leaves takes me back to my childhood. And we all have those memories, whether it's, you know, the apple pie baking in the oven at your grandmother's house or or whatever it is you always have that nostalgic touchstone so by forming those with the food pairing them with the food we can craft an experience that goes way beyond just eating and tells a story and transports you in directions that food alone can't do and that's really our goal with the experience so that's uh... pleasant with burning open and it smells Smells like fat. And if you grew up in the East Coast or the Midwest and you're of a certain age, you know, they just go out and burn it. It's still cool. It happened to me when I was uh, um, driving uh, through rural Illinois a couple weeks ago or you know, a couple months ago in the fall where I actually, you know, smelled <laughs> burning leaves again. You can't do it around here anymore. But, um, and that's a dish that, you know, has less to do about the bite of food, I would say, which is fairly, it's comfort food. It's, it's uh, tempera fried pheasant. With apple cider gel, it tastes very comforting. There's nothing challenging about that. It comes to the table looking like, um, well, you know, on this, what we call the squid um, marketing design. And you don't know how to eat it quite. Um, it's, you're going to have to pick it up, you're going to have to use your hand. But it smells like burning, it smells like fall, it smells like burning oak leaves. We've had people have such powerful reactions to it. Um, we've had people cry in the dining room. Um, we had people, you know, just remember their childhood which is a cool thing to do. And then, if you put something really nasty on the end of that, you ruin it. So it's got to be, it's got to be good. And that's why I always say the food's a given. It has to be delicious. It has to be fun. Um, and so that's a given. Like, I don't want to, like, we're glossing over that. And I, when Grant gave a talk um, with Nathan Merval, the former CTO of, of Microsoft at New York Public Library, Nathan was kind of a belief, um, food-wise, that it didn't need to taste good. It needed to challenge and provoke and all that for it, which is kind of true, I think, in some way. But that's not really the mantra of Alinea. Alinea, at the end of the day, you should end up with a, with a pleasant experience. You're not going to like everything because you're going to get 180 80 different ingredients in a 12-course meal. So it's something that you and you aren't going to like, but you shouldn't disagree at the end about what was best. You know? And um, then there's a couple more uh, techniques there. 
Well, this one we we actually uh, skewer a piece of pound cake on a vanilla bean and encase it in sugar. So you have that pretty familiar bite of vanilla pound cake, just kind of redesigned, reformatted, deconstructed, recomposed. So you actually pick up the vanilla, like use it as your utensil, and eat the cake directly off the end. In this case, you have essentially a tempura fried um, sweet potato pie. It's uh, sweet potato custard, a brown sugar uh, candy, if you will, and a gel of bourbon, raw bourbon. And it's tempura fried on a cinnamon stick, a long cinnamon stick. And we light the cinnamon stick on fire and you eat it directly off the end. And who doesn't like deep fried alcohol? <laughs> um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're in this one here, you know, you have this is a little bit more unconventional, and this is how we start tugging on you in different directions. You have highest in flowers in the outer bowl. In the inner bowl, you have um, a seafood dish. So you have poached turbo, clams, and mussels, and a seafood custard. And that one has really two reasons. One is when I was growing up, um, I grew up in a town that was right on the river, right on the St. Clair River. So fishing was a, was a big part of my childhood. Me and my uncle or my father would go out walleye fishing um, in, the, in the spring when they would start to run. And simultaneously, hyacinth would be in bloom at that time, right in the late spring, summer. So to me, fishing and the smell of those flowers go hand in hand. So as a cook, I'm sitting in the kitchen going, all right, we need to come up with a, a seafood dish. And I start thinking about what is fish to me? What is seafood? I start smelling it. I have the fish in front of me. I'm touching it. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about flowers in the summer in Michigan. So I say, hey, that, that pairing might work. So we put them together and we pour hot water over the flowers and this aroma, this vapor of hyacinth, really heady perfume of hyacinth comes up. And we start tasting the, the seafood. And I say to myself, shellfish is sweet and you make a shellfish cream and it has kind of these nuances of perfume and if you look at the flower um, in different cuisine types, a lot of times orange blossom water is, is used or rose water or whatever, or if you look at the flower simply as an herb, then it kind of all makes sense and they work together. So that's kind of you know, how, we, how we go about crafting the experience at the restaurant sometimes goes beyond the obvious and becomes more intuitive and in the hopes that it's going to evoke some emotional experience for me. And then um, that takes us to the book part, because I guess it's authors at Google. Right. Um, but, you know, I, again, I don't, you know, the book is, is what it is. I think how we got to the book is pretty interesting because you know, Grant, we had been approached by a lot of different publishers saying, hey, you know, Grant, we need to do a book. And they would always come to us with their preset sort of like, this is what this chef did, and this is how many it sold, this is what this chef did. And again, we kind of looked at the rest, you know, as we did with the restaurant, and we said, you know, okay, like, we want to do the book differently. And I remember we got an offer for sort of mid-six figures um, from a major publishing house, and the contract came in as 188 pages. And of course, you don't own anything at that point. And we wanted to do a web component where we could keep it up to date. We wanted to give away potentially the whole book or half the book, um, you know, online for free in order to generate other things and all the stuff that all of you guys do every day and sell to the big companies. We were trying to sell the same concepts, I think. And um, not that the money didn't look nice, but at the same time, you can't control your output. Like you have no idea what this is going to look like. And Martin Kastner, um, who'd never done a book before, and his wife had never done the photography, had never done photography professionally before, ever, um, we were saying, we won't work without these two people. And they thought we were insane, you know, because she'd never done a professional photography job. She did every photograph in the book. Um, Martin laid out the whole book. And we ended up doing it ourselves, and we found that 10th Street Press in Berkeley um, called me up and, and said, you know, the nicest proposal we've ever seen. Like we did a proof of concept, you know, of like 25 pages, you know, beautifully done, you know, and all that. And 
he said, I'm going to make you an offer that, that's a bit unusual, but I'm going to offer you zero dollars, a great back end, and total ownership. Anything you hand us, we'll distribute. And I went, you're the call we've been waiting for. And so that's what we did. And they did a ton of work there. I mean, I don't think we could have done it without them. Yeah. You know, I mean, because you think you, you can just go and do a book anyway. And these are some papers. Oh, there were some papers in the book. Okay. Them ready. But, um, you know, there's a lot of things that there were like a lot of unknown unknowns that we had no idea what we were getting into. And so we, we, um, we learned on the job, but we spent nearly two years doing it. And uh, you know, whenever the photography wasn't right, we had an in-house photographer doing it again. So I think the book came out very unconventionally. We got Jeffrey Steingarten to write um, about dining at Alinea, and we gave him, you know, he said, it's not all going to be positive. We're like, great, write whatever you want. You're a great writer. We got Mark McCluskey, who's the uh, product editor at Wired, to do sort of the tech side. Um, Grant wrote about, you know, obviously where all the ideas come from, you know, some of the things that just on it. And then we just let the recipes stand for themselves. Like, usually there's like little blurbs, you know, why why did I do this dish? Like, you know, the story, everyone wanted the story that you just got for the highest in paper on every page of the book. And we said, you know, when you go into an art gallery, sometimes you have someone standing over your shoulder telling you what it is, but it should be your experience. So that's why the book sort of came out like it is. Right. Yeah, it was, it. Oh, and in the middle of that, he almost died. Right. I forgot, forgot about, about that part. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting process creating the book and, and, you know, very rewarding on many levels. And we have it now. Interestingly, we, we reference it like it, there's a copy in the kitchen, in the Alinea kitchen. That the cooks will flip through like you flip through it at home. But like you're. Back to the almost dying part. Yeah. I okay. Can't throw that out there. Right. <laughs> I was getting I there. I was getting there. I can't throw that out there. But. Anyway, so so yeah, in the midst of this, you know, I get diagnosed with stage four cancer of the tongue, and the great irony, of course, and um, in the same way that we attack the restaurant, the innovative approach, kind of the challenging convention, um, looking for the the essence or the deeper answer um, we did our due diligence and Nick basically flew me around and we went to all these different cancer clinics the major heavy hitter uh, cancer uh, medical centers in the country um, to try to figure out what was going on and of course they all recommended the same treatment virtually which was surgery and they wanted to cut out my tongue they wanted to cut part of my jaw off they wanted to take out lymph nodes on both sides of my neck. It had spread. So I'm sitting there going, like, there's no way. Like, first of all, I'm, I'm 33 years old. Like, I don't know how this happened, but this no, is... And, he, and he's not, like, you know, Tony Bourdain, right? He's like, no smoke in, no right. heroin in the past. Like, that's worked <laughs> since he was five. Pretty clean. You know, zero risk factors, which actually makes things worse. Because, right. you know, if you smoke three packs a day and have, you know, a bottle of Jack Daniels, they can say, well, you know, we'll go give you this treatment, and if it works, and you stop those things, you're, you're good to go. But if not, like, you have no risk factors, you'll probably live six months. You know, this is the sort of meetings we're having at this point. So the, out, the outlook was pretty, pretty bleak, and, but we didn't take, we didn't, we got our first opinion, our second opinion, our third opinion, they're all the same. We got our fourth opinion, and we, we wouldn't quit. We were just like, there has to be something else. There has to be a way to treat this without going through the still dehabilitating surgery and all the ill effects. So finally, ironically, right in our backyard at the University of Chicago, at the University of Chicago, they have uh, a trial that was going on. Um, a protocol which put radiation and chemotherapy first and only surgery if necessary. So you have kind of a similar approach to medicine that we take with food, you know, kind of bucking traditional practices, looking at it for what it was, trying to reorganize things, put it back together, and it worked. So I go through the radiation, I go through the chemotherapy, I lose my sense of taste uh, for about a year, which is a very awkward period to be for a chef. Um, but you learn a lot during that process. You trust the staff. Your other senses are heightened. You learn a lot about what you like to do in life. 
You know, I think there was a lot of people that were looking at me like, you know, here you are, you're you're stage 4B, you, you know, we're not sure if we can cure this, this is very advanced, etc., etc. You're a chef, now you've lost your sense of taste. Um, why are you still going to work? Why are you still going to work? And I said to Nick and some people that were very close to me, I had the best excuse in the world to call in. Like, I did not have to go to work. No one can call in to win the sick anymore. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Not an option. Um, but the answer was simply, I love what I do. And so I didn't want to change a thing. So I continued to work and continued to push, and everything worked out. And, and, and thankfully, there's a happy ending. So. That's it. And so we're working on another book, uh, or maybe two, and um, you know, another restaurant. We're trying to attack the next one from some other aspects that we that we don't like about the restaurant going experience. So we're working on that stuff. And uh, who knows? Yeah. You know, that's it. Thanks for having us. That's an amazing story. And um, hats off to you. It's a true inspiration, I think, for everybody here. Thank you. Um, not only congratulations to the restaurant, but you know, being uh, something that's so challenging as cancer. And, Thank you. It is a great opportunity. If you guys want to answer the ask some questions, I'll just pass the mic around and uh, we'll go from there. Hi. Hi. Um, in a lot of traditional fine dining restaurants, there's this very set ritual around wine service and pairing. When you did this deconstruction and resynthesis process, did you attack that process at all? And what did you, what were some of your thoughts around? How do you handle wine? 80 to 85% of the guests at the restaurant um, order the wine pairing program. And we, we take, I worked at a, I was an assistant winemaker for a period in Napa uh, for about a year. So I, wine's an important part of the dining experience for me personally. And I understand the synergy between wine and food. And we prioritize that at the restaurant. So we, we devote a lot of time and energy into pairing the wine specifically with the courses. Um, our sommelier, Joe Catterson, uh, also, he's also our general manager, is really gifted at pairing, understands, he has kind of the atypical sommelier approach, which is, he's not interested in trophy wines, he's not interested in, 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 the, in the kind of the, the pedigree of wines. He's simply interested in elevating the food with the wine and finding that marriage that really elevates the whole experience to the next level and, and he really he, he does a fabulous job with that it's really an important part because if you think about it we have the minimum amount of courses you can get at the restaurants 12 so if you were to come in and order a bottle of wine to think that it has to go with 12 distinctly different courses it's just simply impossible so you might as well trust the people that are devoting all this time and energy to it to find the right marriage with each course, and that's really what we strive to do. I will say that we did ask a question, which I, you may have been asking, like, why even have wine? I mean, that, I mean, that's a valid question, because that is the traditional piece of, of fine dining that we kept. And we kept it because, A, we really like wine a lot. At least, you know, all the people at the restaurant, I mean, you know, are all pretty passionate about it. And, and B, like, we're, we're willing to do things. Like, we paired a uh, uh, salty water with the course, we paired beer, sake, um, you know, they do uh, champagne, they'll take a great champagne, they'll add um, different liqueurs to it and whatnot to bring certain notes out. So they don't treat wine with kid gloves like you would at, at certain place, you know, um, you know, where they, they you know, you, it's just big Bordeaux, big Burgundy, red, you know, is it? and here it is, and it's the formal presentation and all that. It's more about what Grant was talking about, but willing to go, like I remember I was, I was, I don't eat at the restaurant often, but one time I was eating there and they prepared a, a, a white Pinot Noir from Northern Italy. I, I didn't know such a thing existed. And it was, it, it tasted very unusual and very odd and not so good until the food came. And when the food came, it was like, holy cow, like where did Joe find that, you know? So. Yeah. All right, another question. 
I th thank you uh, very much for uh, coming. And uh, so I've uh, been to uh, uh, LME a couple times, and, and the last time uh, went there with some with some other guests, and uh, you know, kind of all hands said, "Oh yeah, you know, my wife and I have been here uh, a couple times before." And then the server said, "Well, I, well, yes, you were uh, you were here for your 14th anniversary um, <laughs> uh, uh, this year, and then and in fact you were at Trio uh, on your uh, 10th anniversary." So uh -huh. from that service so uh -huh. just wondering what kind of uh, Kind of dossier you keep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would guess. Uh, you know, that's kind of return, uh, visits. You left your house at 743. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, it's obviously important for us to, you know, it's just good customer service, right? But more than that, we try to, um, we try to change the experience a little bit. If we know people are coming back over and over again, the philosophy of the restaurant is to continually evolve. And change so in in the opposite way that people go back to their neighborhood restaurant sit in the same seat order the same thing at the same time the same day of the week we're kind of the opposite of that in that people come to us knowing that the, the experience is going to change and so the more we know about our guests and how often they've dined with us and when they've dined with us then we have the ability to tailor the experience to them a little bit more so that's kind of we, we, we keep track. We, also, yeah. we Google every guest, uh, every reservation. We can't obviously, like, table four, you brought, you brought some, uh, you know, some friends. Obviously, we're not going to know anything about them at all. But uh, about 40% of all of our customers any given night are from out of state, and about half of those have flown in for the purpose of dining at Alinea. So at that point, you know, if you have an architect from London coming in, um, and you know something about him, and he works for Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, um, and here's his background, his interest, and you know, he must be a, a, into fine dining. You're going to like tailor a little, some aspects of the service, or put him at a certain table with certain servers that might have a more European style to them, so that he might enjoy a little bit more. And maybe, maybe your, maybe all of your deductions are wrong, and you find that out very quickly. Like this guy's actually very casual and all that, but at least it gives you something to go on. The lunch down here is doing all of you as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Grant, you mentioned uh, your, your time at the French uh, Laundry. I just had curiosity, what is, uh, looking back, you said you've been there about four years? Uh -huh. That's a long time in the restaurant business. What, what in that time was probably the most important thing you learned from Thomas Keller and the flip side, where did you Well, I started at the French Laundry when I was 25, so it was a very, it was a very, I was very impressionable. It was a very important time in my culinary, you know, uh, growth, I guess you'd say. I, I, I grew up in that kitchen, both as a, as, a, as a person and as a cook. It's really hard to pinpoint any one specific thing that's the most important, but overall, you know, Thomas is like, Probably, honestly, his generosity was, was always struck me as over the top and very genuine and sincere. Also, um, his intensity. You know, he was a very quietly intense person and very passionate. And it was great to feed off of that at such a young age and watch somebody. I got there, like I said, I got there in, in 90, 96. So it was right at the beginning of his really upward arc. Um, you know, 97, he won a Beard Award. 98, he won a Beard Award. New York Times proclaimed the French Laundry the best restaurant in the country in 98 as well. So I was right there when it was really hitting its stride. So, you know, it was, it was amazing to be there at that time and be able to watch it grow and be able to say to myself, this is what I want. It was a great opportunity to, to, to try to Follow that, mimic it, if you will, the success of him in the restaurant. Yeah. Any history behind the name and what was the second place finisher? Huh. So I, I, I'll, I'll tell you. Grant, Grant, when we were for considering doing this together, it was, you know, he worked the exact opposite hours. I was consulting for a hedge fund at the time, and he was, you know, I was up early. And with the markets, and he was 
starting late. late. We emailed back. I remember you sent me a list, and there was about six or seven candidates on there. And one of them was Alinea. I mean, I had no idea what the word meant, and so I looked it up, and it was it's a pilpro. It's the paragraph symbol. It means the beginning of a new train of thought. And um, you know, the other ones were just kind of standard, you know, names for restaurants. And I got to that one, and I was like, wow, like, how could that be any more perfect? And I remember I emailed him back, and I was like, well, it has to be, it has to be Alinea. Like, I can't even believe you found that name. And he was like, you know, good, you passed that test. Kind of thing. You know, like, he was very, like, the rest of the list was total BS. You know, I was like, him. Like, so he was kind of tricking me into seeing, like, if I had a brain and would look it up, I think. So. Yeah. And we're not. We're gonna keep number two for for number two or three. Yeah, you know, just in case. Right. We're, we're out of right. We can't find another Alinea. I, I'll tell you right now. Someone can eat for free for a wife. If they come up with a name that's good. That's our second restaurant. I never, starting with the second question first, I never considered doing anything else. In fact, I remember specifically having a conversation with Nick and him, him saying, you know, even if it comes to the worst and they have to, you know, remove three quarters of your tongue and you can never taste again, um, you, can still be, you can still be who you are. You can still be a chef because most of what I do you know, comes from up here, not here. Um, people have the, the idea that, first of all, people have the idea that the chef, whether it be me or Charlie Trotter or Thomas Keller or whatever, when they eat at Alinea, I'm back there cooking every course for every person. We have 25 chefs in the kitchen, you know. Yes, I, I'm there every night and I plate the food and I'm tasting it and I'm around it, but it's physically impossible to do so for every person, every course. Um, my responsibility is I'm kind of, I'm the, I'm the idea person. You know, I come up with the concepts and, and oversee the execution, but I'm not the actual cook. Um, so I never, I never, I always knew that we would figure it out or if, if, if it had to come to that, I would still maintain what I was doing at that what point. What story at that point? The tongueless chef. Right. Like you, you know, we were just like trying to find any sort of silver lining in that. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard, but that's, that's, we always looked at it that way. Right. First question. I don't know the answer to the first question. Well, the first question could be long or short. Um, one thing, the first thing that popped into my head when you asked was the smell of fireplace. Like we're... Every winter, we, you know, we, like, we basically approach everything the exact same way. And I, I think that's pretty clear at this point. So whenever the season changes, or right before it's about to change, me and a couple of the chefs get together, and first thing we say is, what is winter? What does winter mean? What does winter mean to you? And every year, it's the same. You know, you talk about Christmas, you talk about snow, you talk about the smells and the familiar sounds and tastes of the season. And one that always comes up that's often very comforting and, and a touchstone is the smell of a burning fireplace. And in the same way that we harness the smell of fall, for me personally, I've never been able to capture the smell of a burning fireplace. Like, sure, we could probably cut a piece of log off and light it on fire and blow it out and send it out to the table with some food on it. We could do that, but it would be a mess and this, you know, the dining room would be full of smoke. And like, how do we really, really harness it and control it? So that's one that's always eluded me. Um, you know, and going forward now, we're, we're starting to play with the ideas of, of service. Like, I feel like we have done a, a good job at 
merging food and design together. You know, with, with Martin at Crucial Detail, he's come up with all these different service pieces, as you saw, that make the concept very unified. We'll have, I'll contribute a food stuff, a concept in food. He'll make a service piece that plays off the, the functional and aesthetic aspects of the food. And we basically create an edible sculpture. That's a very unified vision. What's eluding me right now is the component of service. And I think the service at Alinea is special, and I think it's different than a lot of restaurant service at this level. We're very approachable. We contribute. Each one of them contributes their personality in a very uh, meaningful way, I think. We're not that rigid, formal service. However, service, in my mind right now, doesn't merge with the food and the design. So, for instance, let me give you an example. If we have this dish we call the transparency of raspberry, and how it came about was this organic purveyor in Michigan comes to our restaurant once a week. She's very small. She only has a two-acre farm in Michigan. We know her very well. We consider her a friend. She walks in the back door of the restaurant one day, and she's got a flat of raspberries that she harvested probably four hours previous, drove them to Chicago. As soon as she walked in the back door, I could smell raspberries, like intensely ripe, beautiful raspberries. And simultaneously, as I was taking a breath and inhaling that smell of raspberries, a server was walking through the kitchen and dropped a tray of wine glasses. And they crashed all over the floor. And somehow, those two events was the impetus for this dish called the transparency, transparency of raspberry because I had the smell of raspberry, had it in my head, heard the glasses fall, and immediately thought about the fragility of fine crystal. And I said, I need to make raspberries delicate and crispy and see-through, like a glass. <laughs> okay? So we, so we come up with, we figure out the food, long process, new technique, we figure it out, Martin designs a special service piece for it that allows the translucency of the raspberry to glow in the light of the dining room. It's rounded on the bottom, so it actually rocks back and forth on the table. It creates movement with food, which is something unique. So we have the design, we have the food. Now, when they set th that piece down on the table, they say, transparency of raspberry, yogurt powder, roses, because there's roses and yogurt in it. But that's kind of an injustice, I feel. And it's not an extension of the vision. It doesn't complete the concept. So we've been talking about how to do that with service. And we, we never, we've never played with the language. And we have this language. And it's always just a laundry list of either ingredients or techniques or some type of description. So what if they set this down and they told the story that I just told you and walked away from the table? Or, what if they set it down and just said, red, and walked away? Or, what if they walked up to the table wearing a red suit, <laughs> put the raspberry down, really do put the raspberry down, <laughs> and walked away? And, and maybe, through this language, whether it be visual or the spoken word, we can give a better, more meaningful description of the food, of the concept, that unifies the vision. I, I, I'll say this too, is that like, you know, he's throwing out some of the crazy ideas, but one of the things that we do when we're talking about it and the chefs do is that you do throw out the crazy ideas like that. And, and then, you know, we always say it's like, oftentimes we're like doing something and it's actually going to happen, whatever it is. And then we go, you know what, that was the first idea. It was like, it wasn't like the fifth iteration. Now, sometimes the first idea is the best, but, you know, usually, there's sometimes we go to restaurants where I dine elsewhere and I, I go, you know, it's pretty good, but it's a first iteration concept. It's not really refined. And so I think that Grant, what Grant's basically saying is he has a ton of ideas on how to do the service, but it's hard to find that refined thing because I think at Alinea, it, the, the food is so artistic that you walk a really fine line between pretension and overly, you know, self-importance self and, you know, I guess, and, and a theater experience which is good. You know, we've all been to that avant-garde theater that takes itself a little too seriously. And then, you know, if you can't look at it and laugh and enjoy yourself, 
the whole thing just, I don't care who you are and how much you're into it, it just it gets awkward. And so we always try to walk that line of saying, you know, it, it is just a meal, it is just dinner. We take it really seriously, but we, we laugh at it. I mean, it's fun, it should be fun. You know, how far can you push? And like the first time that we, I remember the first time we, we did the pheasant with the burning leaves, you know, the general manager was like, there's no way that you're, walk, you're gonna make us serve something that's on fire, right. right? And then you're dealing with a whole host of other issues like ashes that are falling off, getting on people's clothing and on the chairs and burning holes in the carpet, you know? But it's worth it. It's, it's really genuinely worth it. That's what Joe is always saying that, like, you know, we've got 22 dry clean bills. Right. That's just like, yeah, it's worth it. Right. Yeah. So it's part, it's part of it. It's part of the process. So I'm going to give you the last question. Um, will the cookbook teach us how to deep fry bourbon? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, round of applause for these guys.